without evangelistic ex- uh, exaggeration, it has been the most extraordinary year that I think I've ever had in my life. It really has just been... Uh, it's been difficult to kind of even... I, I've realised that actually, you know they say that you need to, you need to journal... I've realized that I'm actually forgetting stuff that the Lord has done because the Lord has done so much that it's starting to mold into one. And, um, and it, it, it has just been absolutely bananas, really, what, what the Lord has been doing. I mean, just some of the things that have happened this year. Um, I was praying for a meeting I was going to be doing in, um, in Uxbridge, uh, sorry, in Harrow. And I was preparing to preach at the church in Harrow And as I was preparing to preach, the Lord took me into a vision and I went into a vision and I saw saw a building, white building, saw metal framework in the building and the internals of the building. Then I physically heard what I needed to preach. And then that evening I arrived at the building, walked into the room and the building I'd been in the vision earlier in the afternoon was the same building. And I walked in, and the same people I'd seen in the vision were in the building. And, and um, this church, wonderful church, about 90% of the membership of the church are people who have got saved out of Buddhism. They're Shri- it's predominantly Sri Lankan, and about 90% of the church are people that have been saved out of Buddhism in the UK. They've given their life to Jesus. And what the Lord said to me was that he wanted to pour his fire on the meeting, the presence of God falls in the room and various different things happen. But at one point, towards the end of the evening, a lady comes up and she says, turns out she'd been a Buddhist the week before. She'd only just given her life to Jesus. And she walks up to me and she says, I don't understand. I won't try and do her accent because it would be terrible. But she says, I don't understand what's going on. I says, why? And she says, it's like there's fire in my bones and I'm shaking on the inside. And she'd actually got baptised in the Holy Spirit and she didn't even understand what had happened. And she got filled with the fire of God. Then, from there, I then go out to the Ukraine and I go out to a meeting in the Ukraine and as I'm praying for the meeting in the Ukraine, the Lord takes me into a vision and I see a large building with a blue carpet and the Lord, in the vision, the Lord tells me what He wants me to preach. And then I turn up at the building And when I arrived at the building, it was a large building with a blue carpet and God broke out in the room. And it has just been like that this year. I stood with a young lady, put my hand on her shoulder and um, I said to her, she was about 19 years old, an Asian girl, put my hand on her shoulder and I said to her, I see you in a football pitch and I see you surrounded by young people and that God's given you massive influence amongst young people. And I'm looking at her thinking, Asian girl football pitch, doesn't make sense. Just share what you see. And I shared what I saw. And then afterwards, um, I went up to when the meeting finished. I said, so what's the deal with the football pitch? I'm thinking she's a singer. And she says, I'm a freestyle footballer. And she got 160,000 followers on Instagram. I've just come back from Nigeria in Abuja. <laughs> and uh, I know I've arrived as, in, as, as I'm about as African as I can get now because now I'm being called uncle. <laughs> now, now what you need to understand is this is a very confusing thing for me because when, when I'm in Nigeria, I get told, oh, this is uncle so-and-so, this is sister such-and-such. I say, yeah, auntie, thank you. And he's like, are you actually really an auntie or are you not an auntie? And it's just impossible to tell who's related to who. And then they buy me a caftan and I'm in a caftan and it's like, I'm eating, what is it? Um, what's that strange orange rice called? There, there you go. And, and it's just like, oh Lord Jesus, what's going on? So, but there we are, we're in this meeting and, and, um, and it was an invitation over the only meeting and, and I picked this guy out and I prophesy over him and I say, I see you walking around the tent and there's somebody with you and they're saying, look at this beautiful tent, look at these beautiful gold pegs, uh, gold tent pegs. And you're saying they aren't beautiful because underneath they're rotten and you're pulling the tent pegs up. 
and the top of the tent peg was gold, but what was under the ground was rotten. And I said to him, I believe the Lord's saying that he's using you to stand against corruption. And, and I was thinking it was in the context of the church, to be honest. And I prophesied around this stuff. And I said to him, God's going to protect you because they've tried to take you out, but you're going to be protected. And then afterwards, he comes up to me. He was a, he's a member of the Nigerian parliament. And he's been confronting corruption in the Nigerian parliament to such a degree that they actually tried to poison him. And it put him in a wheelchair, but praise God he was healed. And I just pro prophesied over him. And, th and this is where it's at. Did you know that there's been a shift? It happened in September, actually. As we moved across the Hebraic year, there was a shift. Did anybody else notice? Did you notice? I mean, honestly, the, the release of the presence of God has been nothing short of extraordinary. And the level of revelation, um, you've probably seen all kinds of stuff in the news about the Anglican Church and about things that are happening in the Anglican Church, and a lot of it's not good. But then at the same time, in a regional diocese, I've learned all kinds of weird words since I've started working in the Anglican Church. Diocese. And, uh, and the... <laughs> And um, the, uh, the, they had the gathering of the, of, of the ministers at this diocese meet, regional diocese meeting. And it's been that bad historically that the vicar that I work with, he always books himself on a mission trip that week. Because it's been so depressing going to the meetings. Well, the last meeting that they had, when the priests were coming up to take communion, the bishops were standing next to the priests and they were holding the priests. And the reason why is because when the priests were coming forward to take communion, the Spirit of God was falling on them and they couldn't stand up. This is an Anglican diocese meeting. So at the same time that all the other stuff's going on, the Spirit of God is beginning to break out. I was speaking in a, a, an Anglican church just north of Leicester uh, a few weeks ago. And as I'm preaching, there's a guy at the back and he starts just sort of going, bah! And then he pulls it back again. And they go, bah! and he pulls it back again. And, and everybody's kind of looking at him going, what's the matter with him? And then at the end, I go up to him and say, so what's happening to you? He says, I don't know, but you know those people who, who talk about the joy of the Lord coming on them? I said, what? Yeah, I said, yeah. He says, they really wind me up. And he keeps bursting and manifesting the Spirit of God. And God just got him. And then in Ukraine, in the middle of a meeting in Ukraine, while I'm speaking, a lady just falls out of her chair and starts rolling backwards and forwards, shouting in Russian whilst laughing at the same time. So through the translator, the translator tells me that what this lady's shouting is, I don't laugh in church. I don't laugh in church. <laughs> I don't laugh in church. And she was hysterical, just rolling backwards and forwards on the floor going, I don't laugh in church. And then the pastor leans over to me and says to me, you see that lady? I said, yes. Yeah. She is the most miserable person in our church. And God just broke out in her life. God just broke out in her life. And there's stuff that's happening. The presence of God has begun to break out. And we need to recognize that something new has begun in our nation. Really, 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 really. Something new. It's not, I mean, it's almost like I'm already in the second half of the message and I shouldn't be. But I, I'm just excited. Are you excited? Come on. I'm excited. I mean, I know there's other stuff, but there's good stuff going on as well. There's good stuff. I want you to turn to the most encouraging psalm in the Bible. Turn, <laughs> that is obviously sarcasm. Turn, <laughs> turn to Psalm 6. We're going to start here because there's something I want to get to in this psalm. And then we're going to deal with some stuff. And then when we get into 2018, we're going to open some stuff. So we're going to close some stuff. We're going to open some stuff. Are you all all right? How are you leaving? Are you leaving? Are you like leaving 2017 like this? <laughs> or are you like? Rah! Which one are you? Or are you just already dead? It's just <laughs> just look at the person next to you. See if they look happy. If they're not happy, slap them. <laughs> This is where wives go, my opportunity has arisen. <laughs> so, Psalm 6. 
Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger or discipline me in your wrath. Have mer- this is not one to read if you're not feeling happy. <laughs> Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I am faint. Heal me, Lord, for my bones are in agony. My soul is in deep anguish. How long, O Lord? How long? How many of you felt like that at some point? How long, O Lord? How long? Turn, Lord, deliver me. Save me because of your unfailing love. Among the dead, no one proclaims your name. Who praises you from the grave? I'm worn out from my groaning. All night long, I flood my bed with weeping and drench my couch with tears. My eyes grow deep, grow weak with sorrow. They fail because of my foes. Another translation says, my eye grows dim because of sorrow. My eye grows dim because of sorrow. Faint because of my foes. So if you look at the, um, if you look at the Hebrew word there that's used for I, it's the word ayin. And it look, the, the, the Hebrew letter ayin, it looks a little bit like, like a letter Y. And you know, the Hebrew alphabet, it has a numeric significance, but each letter also has a pictorial significance. Did you know that? That Hebrew letters... They're not just letters, they're also pictures. So it's important sometimes that when you're looking at the year, for example, if you look at the pictorial meaning of the Hebrew year that we've just entered into, did you know that the pictorial meaning is one of a door? So it's important you know that. Do you know that right now we're in the season of the eye? Because the word ayin is the eye, and we're moving from the season of the eye into the season of the mouth. It's important to know this stuff. I mean, I'm I'm sounding really wise, but I've learned this from somebody else. So just say no. But this stuff about A-in is really important. If you actually, if you use a Strong's Concordance, and if you search the word A-in, if you actually search the, the Strong's number, and you pull up all of the accounts where that word is used... Uh, a percentage of the time it's translated as eye or vision or sight. And then another, set, another percentage of it, it's translated as a well or a wellspring. Okay? So I don't think, when David said, my eye has grown dim, I don't think David was saying that his physical eyes had grown dim. Do you think that? I don't think that's what was happening. What's interesting is, is when I was in Ukraine last, I preached this message, and I'm preaching this message in a lot of places because I've become aware of the fact that, that this is something that God's wanting to address. That sometimes we talk about vision, and we talk about stepping into vision, but we don't talk about what hinders vision and what shuts vision down. And we don't talk about what shuts down the wellspring. So we talk about vision, 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 and it's important, isn't it? How many of you believe that? It is important. But you know, sometimes the reason why vision isn't being birthed is because we've not dealt with what's shutting the vision down. And what you need to understand is it's not just vision, but wellspring. What, where does Jesus use the word well? If you think about it in, uh, in John 4, he says, anybody who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but anybody who drinks the water I give him, it will well up within them and become a spring. Yeah? So I want to suggest to you that David is basically saying here that, that his affliction and his foes have caused the wellspring of his life to dry up. His vision has become dim. His sense of purpose has been shut down. He's become discouraged. He's become, his, his expectation has been reduced. Amen? How many of you know the verse, hope deferred makes the heart sick? What's the second half of the verse? Isn't it disturbing that we know the first half of the verse and not the second? The second half of the verse is, a desire fulfilled is a tree of life. But what I want you to see is is that as a people, sometimes we can be rooted in focusing on the negative rather than focusing on the positive. Oh, hope deferred makes the heart sick. And everybody knows that heart. Yeah, but the desire fulfilled is the tree of life. Do you want to live in the heart sick or the tree of life? 10.10, John 10.10 says, The thief comes to steal, kill and destroy. That's a warning, not a promise. It's not something you're meant to be in faith for. I'm in faith. To be killed, destroyed, and stolen from. 
But it's a warning, and then God gives the promise. But I've come that you may have life, and life in all its fullness. And do you know that word life? Do you know that the word life, the Strong's number for life, is 2222? Isaiah 22, 22 says, What he opens, no one can close, and what he closes, no one can open. It's fascinating that even the Strong's numbers prophesying. So I'm speaking about vision become dry, vision being dried up. Get to the end of the meeting after we've prayed for people. Young lady walks up to the front of the meeting. She's crying. This is in Ukraine. And I look at her and say, what's the matter with you? And she says, when you prayed for God to restore vision, she stood there with a pair of glasses, really thick glasses. She says, I couldn't see through my glasses anymore. And I realized God had healed my eyes. I didn't pray for her eyes to be healed. But she didn't need the glasses anymore because God healed her eyes. That's cool, isn't it? So this thing with this vision, drying up of vision, the, 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 picture, the picture of it is, I could, if I could draw it for you, it looks like a, a bit like a letter Y, and it comes up like this, and it's got two eyes on the top of it, okay? And what, it's, what the pictorial meaning, meaning of it is this, is that you have a good eye, and you have a wicked eye, Meaning, from this perspective, how many of you have ever heard the statement, is the, cough, is the cup half full or the cup half empty? And it's the mentality of always seeing the cup as half empty. That we can look at life, and this is the eye that David is looking at his life through right now. He's looking at his eye through, he's seen all of his problems, he's seen all of his afflictions. Now when it, when it says, my enemies... My vision has dried up, or my vision has dimmed because of my enemies. That word their enemy means narrow or restricted places. My vision has dried up because of narrow or restricted places. When it says that because of the affliction of my enemies, it's the oppression of being in a narrow place. How many of you felt like you've been in a narrow place right over this year? Come on, help me. And what can happen, what can happen is your trauma becomes your prophecy. Did you hear what I just said? The narrow place, the experience of disappointment, the I've tried but it's not worked, or the oppression of somebody else, or the difficulty, or whatever it is, what happens is, is that difficulty now begins to prophesy louder than the promise of God. I'm interested that David spoke about the fact that there are dreams that God wants to reawaken. Because what can happen is, is you get a dream, and you get a vision, and you begin to go after it, and it doesn't come to pass, and you become squeezed and restricted to the point that eventually you just get to the place where you say, oh, I just give up. And even our sister, when she was praying earlier, some of you, you're like Joshua, Joshua, you've been going around the walls and now you're coming around to the seventh time and, and, and now you're going to see your breakthrough. But you see, what can happen is you can get to that place where you say, well, I, I heard this last year. I heard this last year, but my experience has been this trauma, this difficulty, this hardship. And when you begin to measure things and, and you talk about stuff, when I say trauma, you've immediately got one. You think, yeah, I know what that is. And what happens is, is it becomes your chronology. Do you understand what I mean by that? You begin to measure time by it. We had it, um, David knows, we had a building fire. We had our, our, our church building burnt down and we got into the habit of talking about time and we'd say before the fire or after the fire. And it was no longer the prophecy or the word of the Lord that we were measuring our journey by, but it was the work of the enemy that we were measuring our journey by. It was the disappointment. And what God wants to do as you come out of 2017 into 2018 is he wants you to shut the door to yesterday's trauma. Did you hear what I said? He wants you to shut down the stuff that has caused your vision to be dried up, the stuff that's caused your hope to be deferred. He wants you to shut it, and he wants you to begin to move into this next season with a different mindset. Say amen. amen. 
that you're not going to go into this next season with, well, we tried this, oh, but it didn't work last time. Well, you're not meant to measure it on your experience. You're meant to measure it on the basis of the promise of God. But what the enemy wants to do is he wants to send a storm that comes against you, that causes you to allow the storm to speak louder than the promise. So now you begin to have more faith that the devil can stop you than God's word can bring you through. Can I get an amen? So you go out, you do evangelism, and you go, oh, I tried evangelism, I got rejected, it didn't work. Or you go and you pray for the sick, and you lay hands on the sick, they don't get healed. And what begins to happen is, rather than building your faith on what God has promised, you begin to allow the apparent lack of fruit to begin to out-prophesy what God has said. Amen. And we need to shift. So I want you to see that in Psalm 6, David's basically saying, my vision's dried up because of the oppression of my enemies. You hear what I just said? Listen to what it's preceded by. Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger. What, in Psalm 6, what's David's perception of God? Do you think he thinks God's up there cheering him on or he thinks he's a scumbag? I think he probably thinks that, doesn't he? He thinks God's up in heaven and really he's, he's, just, he's got like a scorecard and he's looking at him and every time David looks up at God, God holds up a scorecard and the scorecard goes <laughs> for everything David's doing. That's the perception that David has. Would you agree with that? It looks like it, doesn't it? Turn to Psalm 23. Are you all with me? Some of you are going to find that there's going to be a release of your wellspring tonight because the oppression of the last season is going to be shut down and your spring is going to be reawakened, the deferred hope. That word there, enemies, is exactly the same word that he uses in Psalm 6. In Psalm 6, he says, my life spring, my vision has dried up because of my enemies. Psalm 23 says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Psalm 6, opposition is a place of death for him. Psalm 23, opposition is a banqueting table for him. Why? Beginning of Psalm 6, Lord do not rebuke me. Beginning of Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He's had a paradigm shift. He's had a paradigm shift. It's not his life that's changed. How many of you know you're going to have difficulties? You are. You are. I think it, um, Ed Cole said this. He was a, a, a minister in the United States. He said this. You're either in a crisis, just coming out of a crisis, or on your way to a crisis. That's encouraging, isn't it? <laughs> but the point is, is this. What happens is, is we can be tempted to develop a theology that isn't realistic that says the time that I'm succeeding is when there's an absence of crisis. But the reality of it is there's going to be resistance because if there's no resistance, you can't grow. Did you hear what I said? It's not the presence or absence of resistance, it's to how you behave in the midst of the resistance and how you interact with it. So Psalm 6, the resistance is killing me. The narrow places is killing me. Psalm 23, the narrow places are a banqueting table where he has a feast. The banqueting, you see, Psalm 6, my wellspring's drying up. Psalm 23, my cup's overflowing. Psalm 6, I'm vexed, I'm oppressed. There's darkness all around me. I'm dying. Lord, how long? How long? Psalm 23, you've, your rod and your even though I walk through the valley of deepest darkness. Does it sound like he's in the same situation? It does to me. But I want to suggest to you that by the time it gets to Psalm 23, David's been with the Lord in the wilderness for a while and he's learned about the nature of God and he's now come to an understanding that his victory is not dependent on his enemies. His victory isn't even dependent upon him. Look at the person next to you and say, I'm relieved about that. <laughs> Your victories are not dependent upon you. I am my shepherd and I shall not want. 
My perfection is my share. My perfect theology, my 24-hour prayer life is my share. No, none of that. Not that any of that's not important. But the point is, is this. The reason why David is in a place of victory in Psalm 23 is because he recognizes that the Lord is his shepherd. And even though he's going through difficulty, the Lord is the one that's leading him. And just because, see, we go, if there's resistance, God must have left me. David goes, if there's resistance, it's an opportunity for me to feast. Did you hear what I said? So you don't go into 2018 saying, this year's going to be a year of no problems. Because it's just not true. It is not true. Because if you don't face any opposition in this coming year, you can't be an overcomer. How many of you are called to be overcomers? How many of you are called to be warriors? Can you be a warrior without a fight? Our definition many times of revival is the absence of resistance. But that's not the New Testament definition of revival. And when you read about the book of Acts, there was still difficulty and opposition. But there was a sense of the people of God living in union with the Father and saying, even though there's opposition, you set a table before me in the very presence of my enemies. So now all of a sudden you look at life and you say, actually, I'm not living in a sense of, oh, what's going to happen next? But you're saying, where's my next meal coming from? Hello? My food is to do the will of him who sent me. The reason why the Son of God was revealed was to hide the works of the evil one. So you need some works of the evil one to destroy then, don't you, if you're going to have a meal? Say hallelujah. Hallelujah. So when you're facing impossibilities, it's not a negative, it's a positive. Hello? So where that's drained your life in the last season, it's not going to drain your life anymore. I want you to stand up. Because we are going to close a door. And the door that we're going to close is the door that says my hope is deferred. Amen? Amen. So I want you to think right now. Is there a point of crisis Has there been a storm? Has there been a difficulty or a combination of them that has caused you to actually begin to look and say, that's how I measure time by? Is there something unresolved? Is there something that's sucking the life out of you that's caused your vision to dry up? If that's you, I want everybody to keep your eyes open. And I just want you to lift your hand and say, do you know what? There's been some stuff that have been sucking the life out of me. And I'm closing the door to it this year. Because I'm not taking it into 2018. So just lift your hands right now. Lift your hands right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Holy Spirit. Forgive us where we've been looking at life through the wrong eye. Forgive us where we've allowed oppression and difficulty and narrow places to cause us to retreat from promise. And right now, Father, we repent in Jesus' name. Amen. And as we step out of this year, We declare today that we will no longer look at our circumstances through that eye. We will not allow trauma to be our prophecy. We will not allow past failures to be our prophecy. We will not allow our our apparent disappointments to cut us off from our destiny. But right now, we give it to you. Now, I just want you to just give it to God right now. Whatever it is, I want you to speak to Jesus right now. Just do it right now. Do it yourself. Hallelujah. 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 Now, put your hand on your heart. Father, I pray that where hope has been deferred, 
I declare a tree of life comes right now. I thank you right now that as we step out of this year, we step out of 2017 with a healed heart. In Jesus' name. So right now, receive that healing. Hallelujah. There's just a sound in it that just kind of says it, really. Don't lose it. Don't lose it. I stand over there in Nigeria with the guys and I see them and then I come to England and find domesticated Africans who have lost their fire. <laughs> and you need to be aware of the fact that God didn't bring you to England so that you could be possessed by a religious spirit. God brought you to England so that you could bring the fire of Africa to England and you could release some passion. Because deep down inside, every white, stiff English person is a wild African that's trying to get out. Really. Somewhere in there. And you'll see it. They'll kind of like start to dance. And they'll be going down. They're standing up on the inside, outside, but on the inside, it's something going on. <laughs> Oh, Lord, how do we get this back? I have no idea. We've got five minutes, so I'm going to be quick. Have we got five minutes? Is that right? We are now in a season, tw- five, seven, seven, eight, the Hebraic year when we, sh- when we shifted. You know, God really runs by the Hebraic calendar, not by the Gregorian calendar, but he just takes advantage of the fact that psychologically we're in frame of mind that he can speak to us. The year changed in September. And you know, 5778 in the Hebraic calendar, if you look at five in Scripture, five is the number of grace. If you look at seven, seven is the young number of fullness or completion. That's why in the book of Revelation it says the seven spirits of God or the seven days of creation, and the list goes on and on. And then eight, eight is the number of new beginnings or resurrection. Okay, so we need to be like the sons of Issachar, that we align ourselves with the times, that we cooperate with God, and we make sure that we're in the same season that God's in, because what can happen is, is the season can shift, but we continue to behave like we're in the last season. For example, you could be walking around in shorts and t-shirts right now, but we're in winter, And we need to make sure that we align ourselves with the season. And what can happen is you can be praying prayers that belong to the wrong season. Send your rain, Lord, and God's saying it's raining. So you need to make sure that the song that you sing and the prayer that you pray matches the season that you're in. Amen. Because if you sing a song that belongs to the last season, you'll lock yourself into yesterday and divorce yourself from the current season. Did you hear what I said? You can't get a suntan if you're wearing a winter coat. You hear what I'm saying to you? And the season has shifted. So you've got five, seven, seven, eight. Five is the number of grace. Seven is the number of fullness completion. Eight is the number of new beginnings. If you get a double emphasis when Jesus said, verily, verily, it's because it's a strong, absolute, absolute. So now put it all together. You end up with grace for absolute, absolute new beginnings. Or grace for absolute, absolute resurrection. How many of you feel like you'd like that? I'm always up for a new beginning. And if you look at the actual numbers of the year and you you look at the picture, you end up with a gate, what looks like a gate. And you find, if you listen to, um, there's a brilliant word by Chuck Pierce online. If you listen to that where he breaks down the significance of the stuff about the gate, that we're in the season of the gate. We're in the season of the door. Now, how many of you walk through a door to get into the building? How did the rest of you get here? You like parachute in? The truth of it is, is you had to step through something, didn't you? You had to walk in. So the point is, is this. I've not got time to break all of this down now, so I'm going to give you bullet points. 
in, in the sense of the fact that we need to make sure that we are cooperating with the season and stepping through the gate. So I'm going to shoot through quickly. I'm going to say to you, this to you. First of all, one gate you have in the book of Revelation where the Lord is speaking to the Laodicean church and he says to them, you say that you're rich, you say that you have everything you need, but you're poor and you're wretched and you're blind. I counsel you to buy from me ointment for your eyes and clothing to cover your nakedness. And then he says, here I am, I stand at the... And I... And if anybody opens the door. You have to hear him and open the door. So what I want to say to you is, is in this season, the Lord is saying, there's something God wants to clothe you in that you're not wearing yet. You hear what I said? And you can't be clothed in it if you think you're already clothed. So there's a level of power that God wants you to walk into, a level of revelation that God wants you to walk into, a level of intimacy that God wants you to walk into, a level of fellowship that God wants you to walk into that you've not got. But if you perceive yourself to have arrived, you can't enter into it. So how many of you are going to walk through that door this year? Amen. The second door is in the Song of Solomon in chapter 5. And in chapter 5, the Song of Solomon, it says, I was asleep, but my heart was awake. That's like half of the church. That was a joke, I'm sorry. And he says, my lover comes through the door, comes to the door, and he puts his hand through the door, and she responds and says, I'm in bed, I've taken off my clothes, I've washed my feet, must I now dirty them again? And basically what she's saying is, I'm comfortable where I am, your point of visitation isn't convenient. And she has to respond to the call of the Lord. The Lord comes at an inconvenient time, say inconvenient time. So that means we need to receive him on his terms, not on our terms. Amen. Amen. My friend, um, we went fishing a number of years ago. Phil, Joe knows this story. And uh, we go away fishing every year. And Phil put his tent up and I was down the road. And in the morning he sends me a message and says, will you help me move my tent? I got flooded last night. And I'm thinking, how on earth did you get flooded? It didn't rain that much. And I went down and sure enough he was flooded. And what had happened is he'd pitched his tent on a molehill. And in the night it had rained and the rain had come from the field. It had gone down the hole of the molehill, through the molehill and boiled up into his tent and flooded his tent. It was hilarious because it didn't happen to me. So he'd got into a place that he'd got so discouraged that he was a worship team director. He'd resigned from that job. He'd gone into working on, um, in recruitment for the NHS and he basically just burnt out. And uh, about a, a couple of months ago, the Lord said to me, do you remember the molehill? I says, yeah, Lord, I remember the molehill. He says, I want you to phone Phil and I want you to say to him, I'm about to break out in your life like the molehill broke out in your tent. <laughs> so I go, and this is literally what happened. I go to my phone And as I pull my phone out of my pocket, it starts to ring, and lo and behold, it's Phil. It's the middle of the day, and I open my phone, and Phil is in the recruitment office at work. He's in the office. And I take the phone and say, oh, hello, Phil. Do you remember the molehill? And the next thing I hear is, (laughs) and in the middle of the NHS recruitment office, The Spirit of God fell on him in the middle of the recruitment office in front of all of the other staff and he's rolling backwards and forwards as the presence of God landed on him. How many of you feel like that was a convenient time for the Lord? (laughs) Not really. And he literally, he literally was transformed. And then we went to a church, Capstone Church over in London and I was preaching there and the presence of God fell on him at about nine o'clock, half past two in the morning, he was still as drunk as a skunk. He's literally, he's in the hotel room, he's in the bed next to me, and I finally turned around to him and said, listen buddy, I'm trying to get sleep, can you get drunk quietly? (laughs) And he's never been the same since. And the Spirit of God broke out in his life. My friend Sareka, who's the head of Foursquare Ministries in the the UK, Joe and I went to go and (laughs) 
<laughs> so funny. We went to go and see them. We went and sat in the lounge and we're talking. And we said, it really feels like the Spirit of God is just visiting at the moment. Then we hear laughing from the kitchen. His wife has been taken out in the kitchen. The Spirit of God's fell on her in the kitchen. We now fall out in the lounge and all four of us are drunk in the Spirit. I mean, that makes church more interesting. Some of you really don't like, oh, I don't like the sound of that. Well, neither did the woman in the bed. I'm comfortable where I am, thank you. There's more, but the last one I want to say to you is the, the other door is in the book of Revelation where the Lord says, John said, I saw a door standing open and the Lord said, come up here and I'll show you what will take place. And there was an invitation from heaven to come up to a higher place to begin to see things at a different level. And from September, the level of prophetic revelation has totally changed. We sat in a prophetic appointment with a young lady and she's sitting there and she says, I'm really praying for my sister to give her life to Jesus and I want her to get saved. And while she's sitting there, the Lord says to me, her sister's name's Jane. I want you to tell her that I've heard her prayer. So I look at her and I say, um, does the name Jane mean anything to you? And she goes, well, that's the name of my sister. And then she bursts into tears when I tell her that God's heard her prayer. We're sitting in a meeting and a lady says, I don't like, I don't feel like I can dance. I was telling our sister earlier and uh, I got up and felt the Lord say, go and say, tell me about your mother. And I got up, walked across to her, whispered in her ear tell me about your mother and she just collapsed on the floor and the spirit of God filled her because her mother was having mental disorders and that was what was crippling her up and I could keep you here until this time next week with story after story after story after story of really very specific prophetic words down to the point of the first letter in people's names and the jobs and the places where they work and, and what instruments they play. One young girl walked in the door. I physically saw a flute on her arm, a guitar in her hand, and I stood behind, in front of a keyboard, and the flute had dust on it. And I said to her, you used to play the flute, but you've been neglecting it. You're practicing guitar, but your real instrument's the, the keyboard. She played all three. Oh, and I forgot that I saw a paintbrush in her hand as well, and she was a painter. And God is just unlocking. I'm not telling you this so you can go ooh and ah. I'm telling you this because I'm saying to you, there is an invitation for you in 2018 for you to walk into a level of revelation, a level of visitation, and a level of intimacy. Are you up for that? Amen. The last one is authority. Because after the Lord said, I'll come in and sup with them, he said, you will sit on the throne and you will govern and you will rule. How many of you feel like you're tired of being governed by circumstances and difficulties? It's time for you to step into your season of governance. Amen? Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Amen. Sweetheart, do you want to share what you've... Yeah. John wants to share. Before, just as she comes, just listen to this. As I was driving from Leicester today, I asked the Lord specifically for a text for you as a church. And the text he gave me was Jeremiah 18. And Jeremiah 18 is the time that the Lord speaks to Jeremiah and says to Jeremiah, go to the potter's house and you will receive the word of the Lord. And Jeremiah goes to the potter's house and he sees the pot and the pot is a little bit marred and not perfect. And what the potter does is he collapses the pot and he reforms the pot. And then the Lord says to Jeremiah, Can I not do with you, Israel, what the potter does with the pot? And I believe the, the word over you as a people in this next year is one of reformation. I believe he's saying that he's going to rebuild the pot. It's not that the old pot was bad but it isn't sufficient for what's next. And in this next season, you're going to find that God is going to reshape you. He's going to create you into something new because he wants to pour out something fresh. How many of you want that? But you know what? There had to be a pulling aside. 
There had to be a pulling aside where Jeremiah said, I'm going to pull aside to hear the word of the Lord. And there's a pulling aside that the Lord's calling for you. Amen? Amen. Are you doing okay? It's getting late. We're just going to let Joe share what the Lord's put on our heart. We'll pray and we'll finish. Amen? Amen. You're all awesome. You are awesome. Because I, I tell you, I tell you, I can't think of anywhere better to be than with the people of God, especially when, most, when some of them are Nigerian. <laughs> I'm playing with you, come on. I just, um, just really, really quickly, because I'm very conscious of time, but when I was praying about this and um, coming here today, um, and I'm very conscious of the fact that this year is the year of open doors, it's the do year of the door, okay? And there was two things that came up, one of which I won't share this evening, I'll possibly email to David. Um, but the second one is I saw many of you stood in front of beautiful doors. These doors were very ornate. They were, you know, you've seen on these really old houses where they're handcrafted doors. They're beautiful, beautiful. And you stood and you're admiring these doors. And God said to you, I've opened the door. And you stood there with a key in your hand and you've tried it in the door and you've tried it. And you're saying, but it's not opening, God. It's not opening. And God's saying to you, you've got the wrong key. You've got the wrong key. The door isn't wrong. The opportunity isn't wrong. What you're facing and what you're trying to go into isn't wrong. The key is wrong. So go back to God and ask him for the key to your next stage of your journey. Yeah? Go back to God and seek him. Say, I lay my life before you again, Lord. I know where you're taking me. I know that that's the right way. But what I'm try the way I'm trying to do it, the way I'm trying to access it is wrong. If there's things in me I need to deal with, deal with me. If there's things that I need to let go of, let go. Go back to God, find out what the key is. It could be a scripture. It could be you've got to forgive somebody. It could be, I don't know. It could be a release that is needed by donating some money. It could be, you know, I'm, I'm being really abstract, but go back to God and find out. Ditch the key and find the right one. Amen. Let's stand up and pray, amen. Let's just stand up. Father, thank you. Thank you. There is a door of intimacy. There is a door of encounter. There is a door of provision. There is a door of revelation. There is a door that's standing open in front of you in this season. And this season you will look and you will see that you have stepped through many doors in this next season. You're going to step through. And some of you, you felt like you've been in the corridor for a long time. I'm seeing visas that have been just tied up and not been released that in this season they're going to get untied up and released. I'm seeing a business situation that has just been going around and around and around in a circle and you felt like it's not been advancing, but in this season it is going to advance and you're going to step through and you're not going to battle with it anymore. I'm seeing a relational situation that you've been going in a circle and battling, but you're going to step through. I'm seeing a health situation that's been just a perpetual thing that you felt like you've taken two steps forward and three steps back, but in this season you're going to step through. So just hold your hands out right now. Father, as a people, we do our best to align ourselves with the season. And Father, where we've been singing yesterday's song and wearing yesterday's clothes, I ask you to forgive us. Lord, where we've been aligning to the wrong calendar, and listening to the wrong voice, right now we align ourselves to the correct calendar. And Father God, we ask you in this season to teach us your language. Now can you just right now, just take a moment and just receive from him right now. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. We receive you. 
We receive you, Jesus. You are the door. And we thank you that we align ourselves with you today. This first day of 2018, we declare that we are aligned with you. In Jesus' name. Now the Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord turn his countenance upon you. The Lord give his favor and be gracious to you. And give you his peace. May every enemy fall beneath your feet. May you advance against the troop. And rise above your opposition. May your most difficult seasons be a banqueting table. Where your cup overflows. And the oil is poured upon your head. In Jesus mighty name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Thank you very much, Simon.